Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We will start now with the uh, first session this morning. And the speaker is Dr. Michael Duma, who is the uh, director of the University of Washington, which is Georgetown Just Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics. And please, Dr. Duma. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, I usually speak fairly loud, um, but let me know if there's any problems in the back. Um, I'm not even sure if this is on. Does it sound like this is on? Is that important? It is. It is? Okay, good. Um, yeah, okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank the Instituto Bruno Leone for inviting us here. Uh, this is fantastic that I get to talk about history and Ludwig von Mises in Italy, of all places. Uh, that's a triple win combination. Um, and I want to thank you for allowing me to give this in English as I speak now about seven words of Italian. I thought maybe we could have some of those earpieces like the EU and uh, wouldn't have any trouble with the uh, translations. But I'll try to speak clearly uh, for everyone. Um, I have the double task of describing Mises's views and describing my views about the book and what happened to it uh, and why it was neglected or forgotten, missed one way um, or another. Uh, to give me to gauge a little bit um, where we're coming from, how many people in this room have read Mises's Human Action? How many people have read Theory and History? Oh, okay, pretty good. We're doing better. Um, how many people have read my paper? <laughs> okay. Good. Well, I think I need to, that's better. I know what I need to talk about and take it uh, slowly and clearly um, through. Um, years ago, when I was a grad student, I was a fellow at the Mises Institute in Alabama uh, for a summer, and I read this book, and I thought it was interesting. But if you understand Austrian economics, there's nothing especially interesting about this book. Theory and history seems like a restatement of Mises' earlier views and simply an attack on other historical views. And so it could be easy to miss the implicit argument about history that Mises is making within the book. And I think that's part of um, what, was, uh, what has gone on. Um, what I'll argue today is that historians, especially in the United States, didn't understand Austrian economics at all, and they couldn't understand this book. We have a tendency as libertarians, I think, to believe that our works are rejected on ideological grounds. And certainly that is sometimes the case, but I think we also need to seek other reasons, other motivations why things are rejected. Sometimes it's simply because we're bad writers or we have bad ideas. We have to grant this as a possibility. Um, but it's also a matter of timing, it's a matter of writing to the right audience, having the right argument in the right place. And what I'll argue today is that Mises just missed the mark. He wrote to the wrong audience. That he was writing in 1957 in English to an American audience. But he was writing really about issues that were popular in Germany in the 1920s. And he was using the philosophical language of early 20th century Germany writing as an economist, stepping into a different discipline history, and writing it for a different country. And so it really fell on deaf ears. Um, and so um, I have a few different sources um, for uh, understanding this picture of what's going on. I have uh, unfortunately not been able to get to the Mises archives. As you may know, there's an archives in Grove City College in Pennsylvania, but it's closed. I called them, I tried to go there, can't see the Mises papers. So unfortunately, I don't know exactly if he's writing back and forth to his publisher or what he's thinking. There's two main sources then. We have book reviews. In this book, Theory and History, you see here on, on the right side, came out in 1957. And it was actually, surprisingly, it was very uh, frequently reviewed. It's just that these reviews are difficult to find. And so um, Bettina Bien Graves did a, uh, a bibliography of Mises' works, everything written about and by Mises. Um, uh, years ago, she wrote this 
made this compilation. And she has quite a few um, reviews of the book in her list. But most of these are from libertarian authors, and it misses a whole lot. It misses them in other languages. And I'm limited on my languages that I speak, so I wasn't able to find them in other languages besides a uh, few in German. So here's a task for all of you in your native languages is to find and send me a book review of Mises' theory and history, if you can find it in any, uh, you know, in Hungarian, Polish, Italian, uh, whatever it may be, may be. And I'll be interested to see what they're saying, because obviously the American and the German audiences are going to be responding to the book in different ways. The second uh, source, set of sources that I have is my general understanding of American historiography. So what is going on in the American historical profession and how might they have received this book? Now, some of this then is um, hypothetical. I don't know exactly, I couldn't go back to 1960 and interview American historians, but based on what they're writing, where they're coming from, I had, think I have a decent picture uh, to explain how they would have responded to this book. Um, and that's uh, what I'll do, uh, what I'll describe in this, uh, in this uh, short presentation. Now, um, first, however, I want to describe Mises' argument. So I'll take you through it quickly. If you have a background in Austrian economics, and um, I assume many of, many of you do, uh, seeing that this is a Mises seminar, and I'm the first paper to talk about <coughs> Mises. I don't know how this happened. Um, <laughs> We need more papers on Mises. Uh, this, if you know about Mises, some of these arguments are going to seem uh, quite obvious, but you have to take this again from the perspective of a historian who knows nothing about economics. Right? Um, uh, real quickly, here's two books in which Mises writes about history. And I think in many ways, his 1933 epistemological problems uh, of economics, I think it's his best work. I haven't read everything he's written. I think he's at the top of his game in 1933. I think that stuff's really good. He talks about history at length in there. And no historian would ever look to Ludwig von Mises in whatever the German title was originally called to, to learn something about the philosophy of history. And so that book is completely forgotten and neglected. A lot of his ideas that he's developed in there in 1933, he recycles in 1957. Um, and some of his, so I'll start with, I have five major ideas um, in his book. He doesn't outline it this way. In fact, this, I think this is another shortcoming of the book, is that he doesn't explicitly state what his argument is. He mostly focuses on explicitly attacking other people's arguments. But you have to have this background um, to understand where he's coming from. First of all, Mises opens the book talking about subjective values subjectivity, axiology, right? And this is the background, this is the foundation of Austrian economics, that every individual acts on their own subjective uh, desires, and that uh, you cannot act uh, otherwise. Now, the American historical profession, if they hear the word subjective or subjectivity, they think automatically about the subjectivity of facts. And the subjectivity of values, they could not possibly imagine, first of all, that that, 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 excuse me, that that is even a subject, let alone that the subjectivity of values has anything to do with history. But Mises begins his argument. He says, if we're going to study history, we have to recognize that individuals have subjective values and that each one of them is going to act in different circumstances in different ways. This is his starting point. And why this is so different is because almost all American historians and philosophers of history start with the epistemological question, how can we know what is true? How can we know what a fact is? Right? And so Mises has started on a different trajectory, and it throws um, people off. Um, the second, um, excuse me, second main point, I'll come back to that slide. I think I've got the slides incorrect. The second main point, then, is that only individuals act. And this follows logically from that first point. Um, 
that individuals have subjective values, but that only individuals act. So um, he says, we can observe and experience historical change only as the result of the combined actions of a countless number of individual causes that we are unable to distinguish according to their magnitudes. We can never find fixed relationships that are open to numerical calculation. And this means we cannot aggregate individuals and predict from the actions of others. We cannot write the history of the nation and treat the nation as the one making choices. Again, it's the individual making choices. This follows logically from his first point. So his third point, which also follows logically from his first and second, is that the, sub the study of history then must develop in a different way than other disciplines. So in Germany, philosophy and history have often been linked. In England, uh, philosophy and history are often linked. You can see on the job boards these days in England, philosophical and historical studies. Once again, from an American perspective, that is really strange. Um, we don't think of those as combined at all. And in fact, American historians um, essentially study no philosophy and we're trained in methods, and we're trained in what we like to think of as common sense. Go to the archives, find the sources, and interpret things. Very rarely do we ever consider things like objectivity and subjectivity. There's one book that's assigned in our graduate courses on this, and most of us don't read it, um, and then we continue on um, with our research. But Mises comes from a German tradition that makes a very clear distinction between history as one of these Geisteswissenschaften and uh, physics, chemistry, biology as a Naturwissenschaften. And of course, the difference is that the Geisteswissenschaften deal with the mental world, that they're choices that individuals make, while the Naturwissenschaften deal with the physical world. And we, we need then different uh, methods to work in these two different disciplines. What this does then, this distinction, is it pulls history away from the other social sciences that work in a purely empirical, purely physical world. Um, and once again, this is a distinction that the Germans would understand, but the Americans um, would not. Um, Mises's ideas on this come from two Germans, uh, the neo-Kantian body and school of philosophers, Heinrich Rickert and Wilhelm Windelband. And here you see, I think the length of the beard is symbolic of the power of the German mind. So the longer the beard, the more intelligent they are. And the only way Mises can gain from somebody smarter than him is to look at these guys with incredible beards. But uh, Windelband in particular makes an important point. He says that um, if actions are determined they cannot be free. I think he says it in other, in other words. But uh, the, the point is then, is that we have to be studying uh, not determined actions, but free actions. This means that history is the study of free thought. History is literally, uh, and there's philosophers in other countries at this time, Croce in Italy is thinking this, Collingwood in England is thinking this, that history is really the study of the history of thought, that all history is thought. Mises says it is the study of thought, but it's also the study of free choices and free thought, that we have this background of the physical world behind us, but what we're always studying is the decisions that people make. And building on the, the views of another German, uh, uh, Wilhelm Dilthey, he says, um, we cannot uh, put in order facts and come up with some sort of line to explain things in history is that we have to understand through our compassion with other people, through our experience as a human being, we have to work towards an understanding of other people's choices. This means that history can never be a precise discipline like chemistry. We can never bounce atoms together. We can never uh, look at two sources and determine something with some sort of 100% accuracy, that there's this false god of the natural sciences which have been coming into history and we're trying to become like the physicists, physics envy, as they call it. Um, 
And so I like to use these kinds of graphs when I teach my classes to explain the way that historians think. And this line, I think, is perfect to describe both Mises and a, and a host of other historians when they're trying to explain how history works, is that the facts do not interpret themselves. And Mises says, you know, look, there's no way that we can interpret anything without having some sort of theory. Now, this theory, when Americans, American historians, hear the word theory, they think, oh, this is big and complicated. I think theory is just another word for explanation. I have a theory, I like to say, I have a theory about how to tie my shoes, right? I have a theory about how to make eggs for breakfast. And if we think of it just as an explanation, we understand it better, right? So we look at this graph. How are we going to draw a line to connect these? We could do it in any possible way, you know, lots of possible ways, right? And so it's not necessarily, the facts are not going to line up and give us one explanation. So Mises, in this sense, is a skeptic. Uh, against those uh, who wish to draw sort of perfect inferences and predictions in history. The, the historical field, in fact, has moved more in this direction from the 1970s. Um, you may be familiar with this in sports. You have these commentators. All sorts of stuff is happening on the field, but they find a way to interpret what is happening on the field to create a narrative to support their own team. Right? That they're coming at it with some sort of perspective by which they're going to uh, interpret these types of sources. So Mises says this is natural, this is inevitable, there is no pure empirical history without some kind of theory. All right, so his fourth point then, and I think where he spends the majority of the time in the book, and what people uh, actually understood. So the American historians, by and large, did not understand those first three points for the reasons I explained. No training in economics, not familiar, quite often not familiar with that distinction between the Natur and Geisteswissenschaften. Um, and what they do like Mises on, however, is his attacks on historicism and Marxism. Now, historicism has many different definitions. It's a very complicated, uh, has a very complicated linguistic history, but essentially it's the idea that we can uh, uh, look solely at the facts of the past to make sense of the world and that there are not pre-existing categories and that we may perhaps from those facts then be able to interpret some general patterns of how the world works. And so Mises puts this in with Marxism because both of them are trying to make predictions. You know, you're very, probably very familiar with Marxist theory of history in which we have stages things move inevitably from one stage to the next. And Mises says all of this is bogus, that if we believe in any of these types of grand theories of philosophy that predict or tell us that we must march in a certain direction, that we're denying the first premise that he made, which is we have subjective values and we act as individuals. Because if any of these things are true, we cannot be thinking right now. And uh, so he attacks those um, on those graphs. Um, this, uh, this view that I draw, I've drawn here, progress, is the view of the progressive historians, which is probably the dominant view in the United States in the 1930s, is that we are marching upwards and onwards uh, towards civilization. The very 19th century view continued into the 20th. And then finally, his fifth point, I believe, so once again, this is me finding five things in his book, is that history, which is empirical, um, we need to form concepts to understand history. This is, we need to form time periods uh, to break things up. We need to uh, create conceptual categories of how people are thinking at various times. But economics is an a priori category in which, as we know, as Austrian economists, we can know things logically, we can know categories, consequences of actions. And what Mises says then is that economics can inform history, and that history can inform economics. When American historians hear this, they want to think, a lot of them think that this is a bunch of hogwash, that these economic categories have nothing to do with the common sense of how um, we uh, interpret uh, history. Okay, so that's. Um, my view of what Mises uh, is saying uh, in the book, and I can uh, skip back uh, 
to this slide. Um, so, let's see where I am. Seven. Um, let me let me conclude then. Um, in my paper, I go into more depth about what these specific reviewers are saying. Um, and I think some of the main points uh, that I should stress here is that American historians are not very philosophically minded. That the discipline of the philosophy of history is relatively new, that it was philosophers that were involved in it until the 1950s or 60s. And that in the 1950s and 60s, when Mises' book comes out, he's competing with many other works in the field. But most of these other ones are common sense primers in historical methods that just talk about epistemology and facts. Mises' book then is lost. All these new books are coming out. The 1960s is this golden age of American philosophy of history when the best critical philosophies of history are coming out. What this means is that for the first time we're abandoning, um, well, we have already abandoned the large speculative histories, the Hegel, Marx, type histories of the world that put everything into one picture and predict things. Um, and we're moving towards critical examination of the facts, uh, critical uh, examination of possible narratives. Mises has a point here, uh, there's a point in the 1950s and 60s where he could have made an important contribution to this discussion. But it's a very short decade in which his works could be considered. Um, and what I think happens is that his attacks on historicism and Marxism are overshadowed by those of Popper. So Popper becomes famous, American historians recognize him and, uh, and cite him in the literature, where Mises is quickly forgotten um, and never cited. And perhaps some of us might argue uh, Popper did a better job in some ways of explaining himself. By the 1970s, the field has turned to postmodernism. Everything is about narratives, about whether truth can exist at all, and about how uh, we structure facts within these narratives that we have uh, preconceived uh, notions of, that we formed before looking at the facts. And so Mises is kicked out on the side. Um, all right, so the point is, there's all these contingent historical factors which show us why Mises' work was rejected that there are those who think that he is just a liberal and that they attack him on ideological grounds because in the book he um, supports free markets and um, he actually, Mises uses the ad hominem quite a bit. He's very, he's a very angry old man uh, in this book. I can really feel it. Um, he's like, you didn't understand me before, so let me state it clearly this time. And uh, uh, so plenty of people find reasons to uh, dislike the book. All right, so knowing this, what is it that we need to do? Um, first of all, I think Mises provides a foundation for understanding a liberal view of history. That as historians, we need to choose to write about freedom, that this is a choice, right? Um, I'm guilty of this, other historians are guilty of writing about unimportant topics. I like to write about antiques and uh, Dutch people. Like, this isn't important for the history of liberty. We need to choose to write about slavery and freedom. We need to choose to write about political themes that make us more free. Um, we need to recognize that individual action is the engine of historical change, right? Um, all these things Mises gives us inspiration for. So if I may, I plug real quickly my book. I'm writing a book right now, co-editing a book called What is Classical Liberal History, in which we try to do this, in which we try to say there is a tradition in which historians are writing uh, from a liberal perspective, in that one of their main goals is to promote history, the study of history, uh, excuse me, the study of liberty in a critical sense, not promoting it as some sort of, um, you know, uh, some sort of like a defense of libertarian or free market uh, regimes without considering the sources from a, a critical way. Um, we as historians need institutes, uh, we need to network, we need to define history, and we need to integrate history into the PPE curriculum that's so powerful 
uh, that, that libertarians have such a powerful uh, contribution in um, already. So I think with that, um, I'll come to a stop. I'm very interested to hear comments and questions, and I hope some of you will read my paper, give me more comments, find me, book reviews in other languages, so I can keep working on this uh, before I send it out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Duma. Now, the comments will be given by Professor Marco Bassani from the University of Milan. Yes. Uh, now, some people, some people actually like and know me very well and know how much I like to criticize papers and actually how I enjoy destroying other people's research. And uh, considering I'm an old professor and you're a young scholar, I should do just like just that. But I can do it so because I like the paper and uh, I think there are a few minor things that uh, we'll discuss in private. All right. Sure. But uh, very few, very few minor things. So we'll, we'll just uh, say a few things about um, this paper. This paper, as you heard, it's about the idea, the fact that uh, it was the wrong audience, basically. The wrong audience, it was th these ideas were felt foreign, kind of irrelevant ideas coming from uh, von Mises. And um, it's a wrong time and wrong audience, the 1950s. It could have been the wrong audience as well in Germany, right? Most of these things were forgotten by the 1950s. You were actually, I don't know if they were actually discussed in the 1920s, yeah, but uh, these were old, old things. The, the record, um, they're, I'm very familiar with that. Now, the other thing that you talked about in your, in your talk is uh, Mises' attacks, attack on Marxism, I mean, two hours it seems, in Israel, it seems devastating, right? It seems a very good attack. And uh, 1957, it's during the Cold War, the free world is supposed to be against Marxism, right? So it's in America, and he might, he was probably expecting to get a little bit more attention on that side, but um, American historians uh, were not ready to discuss anything like. Um, Marxist historiography or Marxist ideas of uh, philosophy of history. Actually, there were they were they wanted to reject any kind of philosophy, as you said. You know, it's philosophy, it's not history. Even if it's called history of philosophy, let's forget about it. So, but actually, when you think about it, they really worship some sort of watered down Marxism that uh, was in, uh, especially in Charles Beard, Bernard Parenton, and the others, and of the kind of. Uh, super watered down class analysis on making the constitution and that kind of thing. These were like three Turner, uh, Jackson Turner, me, Frederick, um, Jackson Turner, Charles Beer, Vernon Parent. These were like the gods for the American profession in the 1950s yet. And then you had Hoves Tucker, who was not a Marxist, but uh, very sympathetic to a lot of <laughs> Marxist uh, views. So, and then, you make a good point. The, the Mises idea of economics was uh, certainly very, very difficult to be accepted. Uh, some people just did not even understand. Um, they were unaware, you say, of the difference between inductive and deductive economic theory. And um, but clearly, you pointed out this uh, school of thought, uh, Windelband and Richard that we know, we, I mean, the people who studied in pizza do that happen to know very well. Because we had a professor who was uh, very well versed in, uh, not only in German philosophy, but neo kantian stuff, of all this kind. So the idea was the difference between the nomothetic sciences, the, the sciences that are looking for the laws, general laws, and the so-called hygiographic sciences, that is, Sciences or the kind of knowledge, field of knowledge that do study a single, singular, and unrepeatable event. So that's really the basis of this, and and, and it's clear that uh, Mises is divides human knowledge into two areas: the external events of nature, and then thought and human action. So in this sense, considering the fact that I'm a historian of ideas, Mises is my hero just by default. You know, is the guy. 
who places an amazing importance to our ideas. Well, you all probably are familiar with that doc quotation from John Maynard Keynes, who says, only ideas move the world, right? And he was certainly the creator of a lot of ideas that did move the world. But um, the way now the important thing is that according to me, this there is no way of knowing how these ideas are produced. And that's one good insight of your paper and insight I like, clearly. And uh, that, that's that's an avenue of a uh, new avenue of sort of research. And uh, at a certain point, what um, Lisa says is that totalitarian theorists are those who support the existence of absolute and eternal values. Right. So this, this the, the first path to totalitarian thought is to confuse physical sciences with uh, social or, or historic science. Now. I don't want to go through what you already talked about, but um, somehow there is there is something plausible in economic materialism. So the fact that uh, that that was exactly what um, what Lisas was about, or was after economic materialism, was certainly part of a not too popular in the 1950s. Even nowadays, when I talk to some, um, I was. Um, some years ago, I was, uh, we were talking about slavery in the South with uh, an American friend, and he was talking, like, for 30 minutes, he was just giving the totally Marxist view. And so I said, could you please tell the audience and the students that this is a perfectly legitimate viewpoint on slavery, but it's not Marxist, economic materialism. He says, is there any other way of looking at history? You know, just, you know, so a lot of people just never would never want a communist revolution in their country, you know, in the United States, Britain, Italy, France, and so on. But they were ready to buy into that economic materialism. There is a, there is a guy I knew very well who was a, a physicist, a very good friend of my father, still a scientist. And he was in the a member of the Communist Party Central Committee of Italy for like 30 years. So at the end of that experience, you asked him, what was it that draw you to Marxism? He knew nothing about Karl Marx, right? So he told me, I just thought that economic materialism was as scientific as physics, right? And so to a lot of people, the idea of just going against something that's that's considered why it's scientific, although it's like part of the doctrine of the enemy, right? That was uh, certainly not an advantage for um, for Mises. And so, but and then and uh, so the idea, the whole idea is that the ideas move history. So it is the opposite of historicism or science scientism. He uses the same words. The other thing is when you read theory and history. There are so many words that are made up, right? You gotta look into them. You gotta reread several sentences, and uh, but certainly this 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 thing clearly does not help. Now there, um, he says, you, you say in your paper, there is a one is a, there are a few avenues. One is the difference between material factors and human choices. That's that's what I certainly like. The other thing is, well, what determines ideas? Now, this is, we don't know, right? The Mises answer it would be, of course, we don't know. But they're influenced by the environment, and uh, we do and we do think, we do have ideas. That's a primary thing of human life, right? So that's, uh, this is certainly a good avenue for uh, uh, exploration, according to you. Now, let me just go back to the, make a couple of comments of my own. Let's go back to the 1950s, 60 years ago. Not such an amazing long time ago. We're talking about less than three generations. Some of us were already alive in the 1950s, right? So, not me. That's uh, the 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 not so the, the less young ones. So, if you take together at least three books that came out in the 50s, of course, I know that the, the two of them were sort of uh, written before the war or during the war and so on. But you take the counter-revolution of science by Hayek, the poverty of historicism by Popper, 
in Anne uh, Fear and Minster, you get the impression that classical liberalism was not doomed to failure in the 1950s. It was probably, I, I wouldn't say a powerful force in the ideas, but uh, certainly these works try to put somewhat in perspective the roots of totalitarian thought, and, um, and they can be taken together as the proof that there could be a place with some ideas and economic policy prescriptions for the challenges of the Cold War. Also, classical liberalism could have been the avant-garde of the free world struggle against Marxism, considering that the Austrian school was the only economic school that ever took Marxism seriously, you know, starting with von Bauberg and Mises and all the others, you know, they took Marxism at face value. All right, that did not happen. After a few years, Karl Popper was worshipped as a great philosopher, but, and then, of course, he watered down his political views and, uh, and sort of a moderate socialism. The Austrians, who are already considered dinosaurs and in the social sciences as well, there was a little dream of non irrelevance for classical liberals for two hours during the fall of the Berlin, Berlin Wall. I know it could have been the afternoon or night, between 9 and 10 or November 1989. I remember you, right? Santi, you had a little dream. Or, well, maybe you would get it all, but uh, that did not happen. So, why? Why is it that for all the amazing insight in the social sciences, methodology, and we could go on talking for hours about all these things, praxeologists, systems of thought, criticism. Well, classical liberalism, especially the Austrian tradition, fails spectacularly to understand, appreciate, and critically explore the most important institution of modern times, the state. I think the failure of classical liberalism is because you know, they talk a lot about society. Most of these things about society are quite correct, and they could start a great debate. But to say the least, the theoretical speculation from Menger to Mises and Hayek, not to speak of the libertarians, which are simply laughable. You know, and I like Rothbard, and I like him very much. I like his readings of economics, but when he says stuff in Anatomy of the State, he says, well, tell the Jones will Nobody, nobody voted on the Jones getting all the arms. You know, it was an historical process that went on for five centuries in Europe, and you got to know a little bit about it before you talk about the state. So, frankly, the analysis of the state from Menger to Mises, Hayek, Bastia, and even the good, the good old libertarians of the past century are quite inadequate. And so classical liberalism is really predicated on a kind of notion that, um, that human beings do enjoy inalienable rights, and the protection of rights is the ultimate test of a legitimate state. So this was like the dream of John Locke, to build a quasi-non-sovereign, sovereign sovereign state. And uh, certainly it, was, it didn't work like a Swiss watch. It was not a, the perfect idea, the idea that uh, natural rights were a shield for the individual, but it was, it was the natural law theory that turned into a sort of a very sophisticated, fundamental legal myths cre ever created in the long history of Western legal thought, and it created a law of the so classical liberalism at the end. It strengthened the state and the power of the state and especially because it did not understand at all the historicity of the state. So natural law turned clearly into statism. I had um, some quotations to show me this, but, you know, and this, this is kind of crucial in a certain sense. Well, there, is, there are some, so many statements by Mises when he says, well, I have to convince the people who are in power that my theory of economics is better than uh, uh, than Keynes and so on. So they are. So he thinks that they actually read the general theory and and they were convinced scientifically convinced by the arguments made by the other economists. I mean, it's so naive that I don't even want to dwell into that uh, at all. So this this is um, actually I think this 
there is there's a failure of analysis, not of society, not of uh, economics, not of interaction, not of theories in general, but vis a vis the state. The classical liberal, the libertarian vision of the state is certainly what uh, what probably prevented most of the much more than the non-use of mathematics and so on, of just classical liberalism and libertarianism being part of sort of a larger debate. So the, the challenge, most, most people felt that the ideas about the state, I think, were kind of uh, inadequate. So that uh, most, uh, in, certain, in a certain sense, it's much better I and mean, more interesting to read on the states or pages by. You know, Carl Schmidt, Max Weber, Otto Brunner, Kinze, and all these uh, German scholars, and most of the things that were said by our champions of liberty, not to for that. So that's my two cents and the failure of uh, classical liberalism, but clearly I did enjoy your paper, and I think it was well written, right, clear path to the point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a couple things. Uh, first of all, Rothbard. Uh, as, as we say in the South, if you're gonna if you're gonna say something bad about a person, you always preface it with "God bless his soul." Rothbard, God bless his soul. It was a terrible historian. Um, I've heard some people in economics think he's a good historian and a bad economist. We're the other way around. As historians, um, I know this for a couple reasons. First of all, he's not citing recent literature when he's doing his work, but his books at the Mises Institute, it's almost laughable. You open them and they got these scripts in the margin and you can just get a sense of Rothbard's personality. That's not, you know, he opens the book and he just flips through it, finds something he likes and then attaches it into his, his, his writing. And so he's doing what I call not primary work in the archives, not really even secondary work, really like tertiary work. When he's taking ideas from other people that have already written that he likes and then putting them into a synthesis of things that he likes. So there's a real need for empirical research on the ground, in the archives type of stuff. And one thing that frustrates me to no end in the libertarian world is all these self-avowed historians that spend most of their time blogging about history, making political arguments. Unless they've been to the archives for a year or two, what do they know about Lincoln? Right? They're just uh, coming up with something. I feel like a lot of it is just a desire to argue. People like to argue. Um, I've discovered this. Historians, we don't really like to argue. We go to conferences, we pat each other on the backs, and we say, thank you, you've made a contribution. Now that I'm working at this institute with philosophers at Georgetown, uh, first couple of months, I, I couldn't figure it out. I thought everybody hated each other. And we sit around in a circle. For an hour, they yell at each other, and then we all get up and go have lunch. I'm like, oh, I'm tired. I feel like my parents were just fighting. Like, these are all my friends and they're all young at each other, right? Um, so anyway, historians um, need to do real research, know what they're saying before they get out and start saying it. You're absolutely correct, uh, Luigi, that there is a uh, sort of anti-theoretical, watered-down, left-of-center progressivism that dominates the historical profession and has since the 1920s. One, yeah. And it's not, and it's not uh, Marxism. It's um, a sort of... Uh, belief that there's a, a common sense way of looking that we can consider all options, that all theories could be potentially correct. It's like a religious pluralism. Like we don't need to completely reject any theory except one that claims that it could be the one and only theory, um, something like that. Um, and then the other point um, that you were talking about, which I think is really interesting, uh, this idea that ideas are not determined. In fact, what, what Mises says is that um, it may be possible, this is a contribution I think that Mises makes to Vindelbahn and Rickard. He says, look, it may be possible in the distant future, um, I don't know if he's thinking about computers or whatever, but it may be possible that we can predict stuff, that we can treat the human mind like the physical world. But for the time being, we can't come anywhere near that. And if we're going to try to make these predictions, these laws about history, we're laughably bad about it. Um, and so something else that I've been writing and working on, I show some of these examples. There's some guy in 1949, I think it was, who says, you know, we haven't come up with very many laws of history yet. But one of them, he says, is that women tend to vote less than men. And we can consider this essentially a, a historical law. 
Now, with modern years, this is silly. I think women in the United States vote more than men on average, right? So, so yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> so it just shows uh, it just shows how provincial and temporal we can be, uh, rather than thinking of a universal uh, picture. So the challenge that Mises essentially makes to these historians of the social science stripe is that you know, show me one law, show me one correspondence in history by which we can say this happens, then this happens, therefore we get a third thing. And this is the misunderstanding of history. Many of you are probably familiar with this, but students are always telling me, you know, you need to learn history so you don't make the mistakes of the past, that history is teaching us you know, uh, about actions and consequences and that we can make predictions from it. This is not at all what history does. If, you know, if it did, we'd be rich. Um, historians are very bad at predicting the future. We're okay at talking about what happened in the past. Yes, there are more questions now. Yes, there are questions here. 